Yeah. yeah. Recording. Okay, cool. All right. So it is class time, everybody. We're going to hop in and talk about wearable electronics. This is, um, we're still like doing our surveys of the different areas of Make Haven. So these are still like get to know you sections. But here we're starting to, I think, feel out what the next phase of the course is going to be like. We're going to cover circuits and electronics within today. We're going to talk about wearables more broadly. We're going to give you a structured sort of assignment with a little bit more detail. And we're going to go over the ins and outs of how electronics work at, at some core level. Because uh, in, in my heart, I'm, I am and will always be a science teacher. So I could literally talk for days and days and days about the things that we're going to go over. Uh, and so I'm always happy to answer any wearable electronics or electronics question that you have. So with that, and without any further ado, we're going to hop over into our plan for, for the game tonight. We're going to talk about some science vocab, some key relationships, some things that go along there. Uh, we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe mathy. We can integrate and do derivatives and do all that stuff if you want. Or so we can just do go well for you, uh, remote remote folks? Folks? Oh. Is she, huh? Yeah. Hello? They might not be. Uh, Kate, can you hear us? I think they can't hear. <laughs> okay, cool. That's good. I realized that bunch of clothes that need to all right, so one moment, please. Here, while you're, while you're here, everybody is... So Let me do... Thanks. Thank you. So they're so they're working working on on it. It. Kick them muted on Wait, okay, can you hear me now? Oh, that's, that's so exciting. All right. So we have several, several things that we want to talk about, that we want to do, that we want to go over. The short version of what I just tried to do as a little tirade is that I am at my core a science teacher, and I will always talk as long as you want about circuits and electronics. Because I think that it's, if, if you were to back up and look at how uh, it gets taught in general, I think it's, it's very sadly out of date. And we're going to go over some of that, the science business, to make sure that you've got those skills. This is our first introduction to learning in this sort of a way. And then there'll be a structured assignment at the end of, of this lesson, and we'll be able to ask and answer more specific things. So we're gonna go through the plan for this presentation and then sort of walk through that way. And then we'll explore what that might mean, all these concepts, how they get applied to wearables. We'll look at some examples, and then hopefully get everybody on their way to, to building wearable e electronics. Um, but a good, a good check-in would just be to sort of see, I think, Kate's uh, question was a good one. How did, how did sewing go for everybody? Just as a quick like thumbs up for people in the room. Uh, that's good. People who are remote, if you want to unmute and give us a quick like how'd it go. Uh, Super. Hi, hi. This, is, this, is, this is Hala, am I? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Hala. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. I'm on my phone. Can you show the room? Um, they should be I wouldn't oh, mind um, a, a class or two <laughs> or just <laughs> like some time with a facilitator in this space itself. itself. I, I did some hand sewing, sewing and knitting and, and sort of refashioning this week by using especially some of the larger sewing machines and the serger, which I really wanted an opportunity to try. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna learn that from watching the videos. So if anyone is doing that work, I'd like to do it with them. Cool, yeah, that, that seems like a, a totally a great move. And we've got two facilitators who'll be able to help you out on that, Hala. And then there's, there's gonna be lots of sewing that happens this week also. So there should be, we should be able to find you some, some things. How about awesome. other? Thank you. Yeah, other people who are remote. Anybody? How did how did it go? This is Lila. Uh, uh, I, tried I tried to, to do, do the, the um, tufting, tufting, and it completely ate the material. The material so, so I ordered, ordered the new, new material, material, the correct, correct material. material. 
Hopefully that'll that'll work. work. Gotcha. Ruby could enlighten a little bit. I was here yesterday, and Ruby and I worked on it. Uh, and, and you may not be able to see her, but she's nodding. There's some, do you want to share your experience? You can come on up and share. You're all good. Hi guys. Um, so I saw that we were using the same type of cloth, Lila, and um, it isn't, um, well, it, I, me and Corey ended up figuring out why I was having so much trouble. Um, and I don't know if you can see me or not. I'm, I'm working on okay, it. cool. Um, but basically, you want to apply consistent pressure and actually go like slower, not super slow, but like less, like the speed is, is less than what you think it should be. Um, and the gun will shoot uh, like more, I guess. It's kind of hard to describe, but um, I can show everybody later. But yeah, we'll but yeah it, and then like what what cloth are you talking about that that you think is better? I ordered, I ordered something, something online, online on the Top, top Ping Gun, Gun website. website. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Yeah, when we when we get to like the show and tell at the end, and when the the video and and audio and all those things are aligned, we'll do a little bit more showing than telling, just to make sure that we're all good. Jer, any, any, um... Or we can't can see now. Oh, okay, cool. All right, no, it's good. So JR is giving me the, the green light, so we're gonna talk about wearable electronics. We're gonna hop in. Um, there's, there's plenty of sewing opportunity left. You can still completely do your sewing projects with all of the other things, but we're gonna talk about wearable electronics and sort of go through this structure of, of the lesson for right now. So we're gonna cover these five areas. We're going to talk about some science vocab and relationships. Then we'll do some circuit planning essentials, some of the pieces that it takes beyond just the vocab of circuits. Then we're going to in, like, just do a quick overview of commercial wearables because that's a hugely, a huge exploding field right now, which is fascinating to see how that all plays out. Then we're going to look at some DIY wearable ideas and there's just a, a sheer wealth of them for us to look at. And then we're going to talk about project ideas. But a big part of this class is gonna be that I'm gonna say words that may feel unfamiliar at best or brand new at worst. And if there's something that I say that does not make sense, stop me and let's have a discussion about it because there's lots of good analogy. I can go way deeper, we can go way uh, faster. It's one of the things about an adult class is that you never quite know what background people are gonna have. And if you have a question, it's very likely that everybody else has a question also. So feel free to hop in if you have any question you can unmute yourself if you're on the call and ask. If you're in the room, you just, just let me know. Uh, we'll take any of that a little bit slower. But those are, that's sort of our plan for where we're headed. So first up, we're going to do this science vocab. Uh, and these are all things that you might have learned in high school or, or, at some, or in college maybe. But um, those, that, those times where we learn it, the high school brain, which I'm very well accustomed to understanding, is not fully developed. Let me be clear. Your, your brain's maturization process doesn't stop until you're like in your 30s. So the high school self has no like good skill at retaining long term. There are some things that stick, but others that really don't. And it would be very understandable if these things didn't stick. So we're going to go through them again. These are the five terms that I think are really essential pieces for understanding if we want to just talk about electricity in a broad sense. And we're gonna go over each one of these in more depth in just a minute, but having all five together, I think is valuable. We're gonna talk hey, about- Can I interrupt you for a second? second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I, think I think Dr. OBS, OBS window, window. <laughs> showing the, the screen, screen capture in for JR. JR. Yeah. In, uh, in the chat. Yep, we're, JR's, JR's working on it. I see him okay. actually okay. going. He's checking. Do, do, do. We're, JR and I were daydreaming about when this will all just work. So things get updated while we're <laughs> between we're just, weeks. I'm just gonna all right. Just, just keep going. Okay, cool. Gonna... All right. Okay, so here are our five words. We're going to talk about charge, which is a property of matter. Um, it's just one of the things that matter is. It has, a, it has these properties, like mass is one that people are often accustomed to, or things have weight. 
It's just the way the world is. Um, but charge is one of those fundamental few pieces that particles have. Then there's current, which is the flow, the flow rate of charge. We're going to talk about the water analogy. A current is like the rate of a river's flow, but in our case, it's going to be for electric charges. Then there's volts, which is sort of an energy rating per charge. It's a really, you can do a fun um, integral or derivative on that if you want to do energy per charge. Then there's power, which is the word that's probably most commonly used. People talk about electrical power. How much power does your phone have? Uh, I'm at 30, like you talk about percent battery, but people associate that with power, even though it's a bit of a misnomer. And then resistance, which is a thing that we want to talk about also to put in context with those other four terms. So we're going to go through each one of these five things, just defining these ideas and trying to go a little bit deeper. And then in a minute, we're going to talk about series and parallel and switches and some of those pieces also. So, I'm not, and I'm totally in your way, Ruby. I'm sorry. So next slide, we're going to talk about charge. It may have been a while since you talked about an atom and like what's going on inside of them. Uh, this is, this is literally my daily, is talking about electrons and protons and neutrons with students, trying to make sure that they understand that inside the center of an atom, where not a lot comes in or out usually, unless there's something radioactive, most of the time the protons and the neutrons stay on the inside, and the electrons are on the outside. Those are the ones that can jump from one atom to the next. And so you don't need to know much about this. It's just exciting to throw up that, that atom symbol every once in a while so that you can see it. The protons in the middle, those are the positive ones. The electrons on the outside, those are the negative ones. Um, and all of this is, is very like an interesting story of how we got to here. A lot of this happened from like the late 1800s until, or yeah, there's, there's many different layers to how this worked out. Uh, but the history of it is actually fascinating. Science history is something that as I get just a little bit older, I'm really enjoying nerding out on like the narrative of how we got to now in science understanding. And so we'll, we'll do that. Um, but like during the American Revolution time, it was Benjamin Franklin in my head. It's attributed to him that may or may not be completely true. Uh, but he decided that positive charge is the direction of current flow. And it was uh, 100 years later or so that we figured out that it's actually the negative charges that flow. But because the historical precedent had been set, we're stuck with Benjamin Franklin's bad idea, which is probably more than one of those we've got stuck with. But in any case, here we are. Um, so charge is something that's interesting. But those charges, the electrons specifically, they're the things that move around and make circuits happen. And what, what happens with those electrons is that they move around pretty freely in metals. And so most circuits are built and based around metals. And we get currents that show up. So in the picture that's here, you can see this tube. That's like a, an electric wire, an electrical wire. Any, any wire at all would have a surface like that. And so you can imagine those electrons sort of sliding along the wire. And even though it's in German, uh, there is the the technical definition of current, which is to the, in this case, to the left. And then the physical reality of where charges flow is to the right. I don't sprechen the Deutsch, but you can see that the, the physical flow is to the right for these electrons, but the conventional charge is that way. That was Benjamin Franklin getting it wrong. It took us another 100, 150 years to figure that out. Uh, but this is, this is where we're at. But current is about the flow of electrons through wires. And we're going to just exclusively talk about the flow of conventional charge or conventional current flow. So we're going to essentially forget about the electrons and just imagine flowing positive charges, which is opposite where the electrons actually move. Good to have that in the back of your head. But essentially, we're going to think about flow rates. And current is something that is a definitional part of the metric system, which in America we don't use a lot of. Uh, but it's one of those core measurements that it's based around. In 2019, they actually did some redefining of things. And the ampere, which is how you measure current, was one of those core definitions of the metric system. So the ampere or amp, or sometimes milliamps, just like you can have millimeters and meters, that's how we measure current. And so we're going to talk about amps and milliamps as we consider circuits in different contexts. Although all of our math, because I know that math is, is sometimes not a fan favorite, it will be back of the envelope style math. It won't be formalized equations too much. You can definitely get there. And there's a lot of richness to that world to try and understand that. But it won't be necessary for a lot of what we're doing. 
but being able to do a little bit here and there is going to be useful. Um, the, the definition of that is really amazingly dense. Uh, when you talk about current, it's the flow of charge. So it's, current is really talking about the flow rate of charge, those electrons or, or protons, positive charge, if you want to imagine that, and their flow with relation to time. And if you're really drilling down, time is defined by the vibrational rate of a cesium atom, which is its own whole thing that we don't need to get into. It's just fun to like get that nerdy for a second or two. But current is the flow of charge through a wire. And then you might have heard of alternating and direct current. Those are terms that might be in your head. If we're talking about current, it's worth it to talk about alternating and direct current. But I want to follow that up with immediately saying, we're going to basically just do direct current for this class and for our purposes. Most of the stuff at Makehaven is going to be projects that base themselves around direct current for a bunch of reasons, including it's just easier to wrap your head around. Uh, direct current. You can think about current flowing through pipes as, as water flowing through pipes. And so it gives us a great analogy that we're going to explore a lot further. Um, but there is a relationship to these two. You need to know that they both exist. What comes out of the wall is alternating current. Uh, what's going on inside your cell phone is all direct current. When it comes out of a battery, electricity is all a direct current source. So it travels in one direction from a positive terminal to a negative terminal, or to ground. And so electricity in a direct current circuit travels in one singular direction, which is really useful to know. It's easier to plan. You can, you can design your circuits relatively easily to work with that. Alternating current has its great uses. Um, and this, the, there's an interesting historical dilemma to alternating and direct current. There was Thomas Edison, who's an often cited American hero, was a big fan of direct current. And then there was another scientist, Nikolai Tesla, uh, who was an American immigrant, who was a big proponent of alternating current. And we have AC in our walls. He's the one who ultimately won, was the immigrant, which is really cool. Uh, and the narrative of how those two interacted is fascinating. There's definitely some good Netflix documentaries on it. Uh, alternating current is useful, and you can easily get it to switch voltages and to turn from alternating to direct current. It's definitely more complicated to go from direct current to alternating. Um, but a good example of where that might happen for you in your everyday life is inside a cell phone charger. You plug the cell phone charger into the wall, it pulls the AC 110 volts out of the wall, and then it switches it through this like, this is a rectifier bridge. It puts the current in through this wavy symbol, in through these collection of diodes, and you get direct current out. It only takes four or five electrical parts to go from AC to DC. It's not a smooth or good, current, but it is, it's an easy conversion. It's something that you can do there. You won't need to do it in your projects that are going to come up this week at all, but it's good to know that those both exist because oftentimes people have questions about mixing those up, even if it's just that they love ACDC, the band, and then they want to know if the thunderbolt in the middle has to do with electricity. It totally does. So those are all very reasonable things to be interested in and ask about. You can obviously go way, way deeper on all of these. Um, but we're going to keep moving with some definitions. Voltage is a big one. Um, so when we talk about circuits, one of the, the two main words that people will know is voltage. And so you might know that a USB drive runs at 5 volts. You might know that a car is on a 12-volt battery. You might know about the alkaline 1.5-volt cells or the 12-volt, uh, or lots of different cases where you have different voltages. Inside your cell phone, the lithium polymer battery that's in there its chemistry makes that thing run at 3.7 volts. When it's fully charged, it's 4.2. And then when it's about to die, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 3.7. Um, it has to do with the chemistry of the battery, what its voltage is. And it's a per cell basis, which is a fascinating thing. Batteries are something that we'll get into a lot, especially as we talk about wearables. Batteries as a fuel source were some of the first ways that we generated electricity uh, because it's a chemical reaction that makes electrons want to move. And so just having that dynamic where you can get chemical reactions to make electrons want to move became a great way for people to fuel up circuits and to get them to go. There's still a great way. It's the best way to have power disconnected from a grid is to use a battery like this. And there's several different versions and chemistries and things that you can do to make them work. Um, just to, since we have them on screen, up in the top right, 
Up here are the alkaline cells. Those are the everyday batteries, the one that are probably in a random pile at the bottom of a drawer somewhere at home. Those are the, the double A's, the triple A's, the D batteries, and the nine volt batteries. Those, uh, I, one of the people who subbed at my last school worked at a factory for decades where they made batteries. And his assessment of them was it's salty dirt in a little metal can. And that's all it is. Like the, the right salt combination, the right uh, liquid phase, and you get electricity to come out of those, those little cans. And so you can get one and a half volts just based on the chemistry that's happening there. The nine volt battery is an interesting case, um, but what I would invite you to do if you have a dead nine volt battery is very carefully tear it apart. The cells for alkaline batteries always generate one and a half volts. And so a nine volt battery has six cells inside of it. If you take apart that little metal can on a nine volt battery inside in one form or another, whether they're rectangular or tiny cylinders, there's six little batteries inside, which is really cool, actually. It's fascinating, but they're kind of expensive. So wait until they're dead, then take them apart. Um, then there's lithium ion batteries, which you're gonna get one of those today from us. Those little three volt cells, these are coin cell batteries. I don't know if you can see it from home, uh, but these little coin cell batteries run at three volts. They have lithium in their chemistry, which is an, a, more, a smaller atom. And so you can pack the energy a little bit more densely. Then there's LiPo, which is related. That's the kind of battery that's inside your cell phone. Usually it's a squishy package. If any of you remember the days of cell phones when they could be taken into halves and the batteries replaced, oftentimes those batteries weren't hard. They had like a squishiness to them because the lithium polymer doesn't, or it's usually put into an expandable case because when they fail, they puff up and then they expand. The Samsung S7, remember that? It would, it would burst into flames in people's pockets because they would push too much current through those batteries and their chemistry started to degrade. So the chemistry of a battery is a real thing that has to be really factored in. And most of the time, an engineer who's setting that up, they factor all of that stuff out for you. So that as the end user, you've got no way that you can hurt the battery. Um, but one of the things that we're gonna be doing is playing around with the limits of batteries where you maybe shouldn't. And so it's good to know just sort of a little bit about the battery chemistry that you're playing with. That said, one of my favorite battery chemistries, uh, maybe paradoxically, is lead acid batteries. They're super reliable. They can put out tons of current and they're really stable. Um, they're easy to recharge and they work well. Are the lead acid batteries that are really common in cars. They get used to start up engines all the time. Not in electric cars, those are lithium batteries but in a standard gasoline car, it's a lead acid battery. For a marine deep cycle, it's a lead acid battery. And those put out lots of current in very short bursts. They work super well for that. Uh, and they're really fascinating things to have available as power sources, because they're very stable. And then there's nickel metal hydride batteries way down at the bottom. Those are interesting, rechargeable. If you've ever bought a rechargeable AA battery, it was a nickel metal hydride. Those can be charged and recharged uh, just like lead acid batteries and lithium ion batteries, those go through reversible chemical reactions. So you can drain them and then you can charge them back up, which reverses their chemistry so that you can recharge them. So anything with a reversible uh, chemical reaction, those are called secondary batteries. Primary cells are ones that just get drained. So alkaline cells are primary cells, primary batteries. You can't recharge a normal AA. Once they're used up, they're done. Uh, which is interesting, it does affect the chemistry and I don't have one, uh, but there's good videos of people who drop AA batteries onto a table to see how much they bounce. And if they, I forget, I think if they do bounce, they're dead. And if they don't bounce when you drop them, they still have juice in them. And like actually juice that's moving around inside, which is why they, they don't bounce. So there's some interesting, there's some interesting things to take into that, but voltage comes from these batteries and their chemistries. It's the energy that you get and it's energy per charge. So a nine volt battery gives more energy to each electron that's moving through the circuit than a one and a half volt battery does. And so it's important for us to think about what is the voltage and how do those voltages compare. A lot of the things that we're gonna think about is do you have enough voltage? Do you not have enough voltage? How's that working? What are you running at 12 volts? Are you running at five volts? Just to understand the energy that each electron needs in a circuit, most of the time, we're gonna be asking that question, what's your voltage at somewhere between zero and 12? So we're gonna learn what a multimeter is over time. We're gonna learn all those sorts of different skills. There's lots of pieces to unpack here, 
but voltage is definitely an expression of energy and that often is gonna come from batteries for our cases. So we'll keep going. Power is the next step. So if you have a battery, you can imagine a source of power, but then you have something that uses power. And so power is a concept, it's about energy use, how much energy is used at a certain rate or how fast it's used up. Power is often useful for predicting like how long your battery would last. So last week, Jamie was asking about low power heaters versus a high power heater. A high power heater would drain your battery very quickly and a low power heater in theory would heat you, but it would use that power over a longer period of time. You can imagine sort of like a person who's a lead foot always on the gas and so they use up their fuel faster in a car than somebody who eases their brakes. They, they ride smoothly. It's not a lot of hard stopping and starting. And so they're not always burning up their gas as they hit the accelerator. As a, as a kid, I had an old clunker of a car. And if I had to accelerate on the highway really fast, I could watch my fuel gauge drop. It was that bad. Uh, so it was those that had a very high power output, which was great. Um, but it really ate up my very limited budget for gas as a kid. So thinking about your power as your energy use rate is something that can be very useful. And we're gonna explore it as we talk about having one or four or five or three or two LEDs and how that dynamic is gonna change the course of your circuit for this week. And then the last one that we wanna talk about in that list is resistance. So if you have current that's flowing through a circuit, if charges are moving from point A to point B because a battery is pushing them around, then you're gonna have this opposition to them flowing. If, if you're in a perfect world with perfect wires, then you can get current to flow directly from one place to another without anything in the way. But just like so much in life, there's always oppositional forces. There's friction, which is a great uh, memory tool. You rub your hands together and they get warm. You can feel that friction happen. And the same thing happens in a circuit where the electrons running through the wire, they rub up against the atoms that are there. They bounce off of the atoms in their way. And when that happens, they get warm. And so some things have lots of resistance. Some things have less resistance. It's pretty rare to have something with zero resistance. They do exist. We call them superconductors. It's a whole interesting class of materials. If you haven't ever watched a video of superconducting magnets, you should totally find that. Uh, on the internet, but conductors in general fall into to two, things in general fall into two classes, conductors or insulators. Conductors have very low resistance and they let electrons flow very easily, and insulators have very high resistance and they keep things from flowing very easily. It's more of a squishy boundary than a hard boundary, like we would teach in elementary school where there's a distinction between conductors and, and insulators, uh, but most things fall into one of those two classes pretty neatly. Um, you, you uh, person, are an interesting counterexample. Your skin is really insulative, but everything inside of you, just below the skin, super duper conductive. In fact, your entire neural system, all of your neurons and their interconnections, they're based on electrical charges passing back and forth uh, and, and making sure that you have protons that are pumped through in just the right ways. And that can be disrupted for lots of different reasons, which has interesting implications. There's lots of different pharmaceuticals to try and make sure that that works in just the way that we want it to. Uh, but it's an interesting process to think about electrical conductivity in different contexts and, and in places you may not immediately imagine it. But a big part of that is Ohm's law. Uh, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about Ohm's law and how it fits. And that's this relationship V equals IR. This is a link. There's several things that are linked in this slideshow. I would totally recommend you go back and tape, take a deeper look at. Like this is a nice article trying to explain Ohm's law, just that voltage is equal to current times resistance. So there is a link between those three concepts that's very neat and tidy. It's a tiny little equation, so you can imagine the math can be nice and easy. You probably won't need to use it much, uh, especially with hobby electronics. When you get to the edge and you're pushing that boundary, it can be a very useful concept. Um, for a lot of the things, and especially this week, you won't need it probably at all. But it is, it is good to know that it exists there and where to go deeper to find it. Another big thing that is commonly talked about in circuits is series and parallel. And so there are, there's a lot of good applications of this. Having taught high school physics for many, many years, this, the state of Ohio, and I'm gonna make the assumption the state of Connecticut, 
really loves to obsess over series in parallel, not as a point of logic, but as a point of math uh, in a physics class. So if you've ever taken a high school physics or college physics, you might have remembered the anguish of series and parallel circuits. When, and I think that that's, it's a noble pursuit, but it is something that I want to think about just sort of sequentially and logically. We're going to talk about water or a water analogy for all of our circuits. And I think that that's coming up very soon uh, in one of these slides. But you can imagine these symbols each have a meaning. And so over here, there's an on the whiteboard, I drew up some of those symbols just so that you could see them if you wanted to take a look. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to leave them there because apparently the whiteboard needs a little bit of love every now and then. So I'm going to make sure that that has the, the symbols up there for you. But in the diagrams that are up here, the one on the left has got uh, two batteries that are right here. So these are two batteries, which you can imagine as sort of a water pump as a way to push electricity through a circuit is a good way to imagine a battery and like its role in the circuit. It's the water pump that pushes water through the wires, through the, through the pipes, right? And so if that's a water pump, you need to have a way to express how that goes. And as you're imagining water coming out of here, you can think about a manifold where there's multiple ways for that current to flow. We have a whole water analogy page coming up in a second. But in parallel, there would be multiple paths for that current to flow, whereas in series, it would flow only through one loop. Right? So it's going to be pushed through multiple things in a row. And in the context of your life and your home, series and parallel comes up a lot. A light switch is in series with the light because the switch turns the light on and off. If the switch is off, the light is off. If the switch is on, it lets current flow and the light turns on. So those are in series. And your outlets are in parallel with each other. Sometimes an outlet can be in series with a switch if you have one of those switchy outlets to turn on a lamp. But most of the time, your outlets are just in parallel with each other. So when you plug something in, uh, it can turn on or off independently of other things. We're going to see in a second that you can turn on and off parallel branches without impacting the other ones much at all. So we're going to take a look at that in just a second also. But it's good to see that series and parallel have these different connections. What's up? Three-way switches are uh, in parallel, and there's some really interesting connections that go along with it, uh, which we can draw out on the whiteboard in a, in a couple of minutes. But it's, it's a series slash parallel combination. And uh, the more interesting you get than just defining things as singularly series or singularly parallel, the more interesting uses you get. So that's a special class of switch that you get wired up in, in sort of a combo series parallel all of which you will not need for wearable electronics. But it is interesting. And then, oh, here are, we're loading four videos. Uh, I love Crash Course. It's a great way to like get an overview of a concept. And so if you're feeling like after all of this, you'd like to go back and review these concepts, there is a lovely uh, lady with a doctorate in mechanical engineering and fluid dynamics that does these videos, she's phenomenal. She goes over electric current and explains it in a nice plain spoken language. DC resistors and batteries, puts those into context, and then series in parallel. There's an entire Crash Course Physics series if you just wanna go a little deeper. Each one of these is like 10 to 20 minutes on average, but they're lots of fun and the animations are great. There are other videos, other things out there. These are put out by PBS or they're endorsed by PBS. And so they're, they're really nice videos. Uh, they're well done. The production value is high. It's totally worth watching these. So I would 100% recommend, although we're, we're not going to watch them now. But they are completely worth doing. Oh, it's going to try. Yep, PBS Digital Studios. Let's see if we can click on. Nope. Oh, it's going to try and play every one of them. Fascinating. Next slide. Yeah, OK. Can we just go to the next slide? Sure we can. Great, OK. So those are all of the, the like core things. But what do you do if you want to actually build a circuit? Like those are the concepts and the terms. But what do you do if you want to make something instead of just talk about making something? Because this is where I think that a lot of the, the high school and even college level curriculum for circuits breaks down. Is they often will go over these ideas and the words and make sure that you have that language that's there. But then they don't give you the necessary steps to actually make it into something. So we're going to try and make that happen. And then just to be clear, 
the, I love this quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If, if there's one thing across the course that I can do that is the closest to giving you like wizardry powers, it's understanding how electrons move around and how to control that. You can make things that will respond to their world, that will talk back to you, that will, that will move on their own. All of that can be done simply by being able to expertly and meticulously control where and how electrons move. Electrons interact with each other a lot stronger than your everyday interactions of gravity that pulls you to the ground or when you throw a ball across the yard. The strength of electrons' interactions with each other is really a strong and motive force that can take an idea that you have and push it into a reality and make something come alive in a way that's hard to make happen in any other form. So being able to manage and design circuits is something that while it can feel academic or remote or tough, when you get it to actually happen in front of you on a little table, it's wildly exciting and it becomes empowering. You can start to build things that light up, that share ideas, that highlight actions, that respond to you. A 3D printer is nothing but an electronics project, right? And at some level, all it is is getting things to move around, to get them to move electrons, to move motors, to, to heat things up, to cool things down. All of that is just a series of electronics projects. So, we're gonna go from here and start to step into this world of circuits in an applied sort of sense. So here, here are my guiding questions for if you've got an electronics project you wanna undertake. First off, you wanna know what your primary goal is and especially at the beginning when you're not already especially good at circuits, you wanna ask yourself, what is the one thing that I want this to do? Do you want it to light up? Do you want it to move? Do you want it to do, uh, do you want it to make a sound? Do you want it to, to get hot or get cold? Those are all important questions that you want to address. And I would strongly recommend that for the beginning, you want to start with simple goals like that. You don't want to have it 3D print something as your first move of a project you're going to build. You want to stick to something that's relatively straightforward, that you understand sort of a pathway of how to get there, and you want to choose primary goals that are, are well-defined and won't have scope creep as a problem, right? So choosing a primary goal, especially as you're getting started, is a really important part of getting going. Then you wanna think about what constraints you have. And so this week, if you're following our like suggested path, the constraints that we're gonna give you are the things that we hand you, right? And so if you're just doing the LED sequins, if you're doing these like sequin lights, uh, the LED sequin deals, and then the battery pack, that's gonna be a set of constraints. It limits the voltages and sort of the ability of what you're doing, but it is in no means what we're saying is an only thing you could do this week. You can certainly go well outside of this realm. We're just trying to provide a structured format for this first exploration. And so then, if, if you know what those two questions are, the next thing would be to think about what components do you know about that will help you achieve those goals. So if you wanna light something up, you might want an LED, if you wanna make something warm, you're gonna need a heating element. If you wanna make something move, you're gonna need a motor of some sort. And so identifying what electrical components will do those things. And you can usually do an, a quick Google search of how do I use electricity to make something warm? And you'll find heaters. Or if you do something uh, cold, to make something cold, you'll find Peltier plates, because there's really only one electrical way to make things cold, uh, which is interesting. And then there's the ways to light things up, to make things move. There's, there's like at least four different major classes of motors that you could work with to make things move. So there's lots of different options, but trying to understand a little bit about that is a good next question. Then how do you control it, right? Is it an off and on thing? Do you need to have fancy control? Will it need to be a smart item? And for, the, for wearables this week, my strong suggestion is don't try and make a smart thing. It would be cool if it was responsive to the world, but if this is your first foray and uh, you know, you're not sure about how to do the code thing yet, it's good to make something that's a little bit dumb, where it's a switch that turns it on and off is a great start to getting going with all this. It's because that's at the core of it. Once you make something smart, essentially what you're usually just doing is turning something on and off much faster than you can on your own. So you're using electrons and, and some coding to make that happen for you. And then the last bit is how much power are you gonna need? which is sometimes uh, a really complicated question, and sometimes it's, I'm gonna use a battery because that's what I have and it'll light it up, and when it runs out of power, it runs out of power, right? 
we're hopefully not building mission, no one's building a pacemaker for their wearables activity. And so you don't have mission critical things that if they, they run out of power too early, you have major problems. If you're putting LED sequins on a face mask, you run out of battery, the lights don't light up anymore. And that's, that's a great scope for our first goals. So we wanna to stick to something that has that, but it, it can be really important to understand how long are the lights on your backpack gonna light up if you have a 15 minute ride home. Will it stay lit for all 15 minutes or is it gonna die by the time you're halfway home? So those are all important questions to consider as you're looking at, at these sorts of things. So let's talk about the structure of a circuit. You're gonna be building circuits this week in your wearable electronics. And we've got several examples up here on screen. And we're gonna go through lots of these examples and, and things to look at, just so that we have some of the vocabulary that goes along with it. Up here on the top left, this is a breadboard. And so a breadboard like this is a way to temporarily put things together to make connections that can easily be broken so that you can push things into place and then pull them out. Uh, and that's a great way to test any circuit that you wanna use. It's a great way to make a temporary circuit or even I've seen people make semi-permanent things on breadboards. But the problem is, is that pieces fall out of them. They're held together with little clips. And so if you're thinking about this in context of wearables, a breadboard is gonna be a bad choice because it's not gonna have the staying power. You know, if you're wearing it to dance, it will eventually fall out of its little opening and then it will stop working. So if you're using breadboards, it's gonna be a, a piece that falls apart. Another way to build a circuit is freehand soldering, which is this next one. That's a little subsection of an LED cube. Soldering is great to do with lots of metal to metal joints. And we're gonna do some soldering for sure over the course of the week. Soldering is a, a tool and a strategy and a thing that we can use. Um, you, could, you could probably avoid it completely this week if you wanted to. And I can 100% guide you through on Thursday or some other day this week. But soldering is a way to make metal to metal connections. That's usually more for like electrical connections than they are for structural connections. And so one of the things that I wanna do is push out a few videos for you to watch of someone soldering up close and then I wanna be here to help anybody who wants help with it while soldering. So we're, we're gonna take a look at those things. But freehand soldering is this method, which can make some really delicate and interesting art, uh, but it's also maybe not a great choice for wearables. A perf board are these things, those are little boards with solderable pads. Those get to be slightly better choices for wearables. There are little holes in a piece of fiberglass, and those are really neat ways to get things connected to one another. They're a little, they're more permanent than a breadboard because you solder them in place. They're, they're semi-permanently connected together uh, and they're rigid. So they're, they're nice and, and good surfaces that bring connections together and make a nice solid circuit. Um, one thing that's a downside for them is that they are, they're rigid. So they're, they're often rectangular or square pieces that are kind of hard. And if you're imagining it like in a garment stuffed in a pocket, it's gonna be noticeable just like a cell phone is noticeable, right? So if you're trying to hide your electronics, that can be tricky, but they can also be really useful. The, the LED sequins are on tiny circuit boards. Um, and so in the right context, they're totally the right choice. Um, then down here on the bottom left, these are flexible custom circuit boards. And so that's a relatively new class of how circuits got made. The printed circuit board just to the right, the little green thing, that's a standard printed circuit board and we've got a few that I wanna show you also. Uh, I've been making some things for future weeks for us. And these are printed circuit boards that are like, you know, a 16th of an inch thick. They're rigid pieces that have electrical traces that go through them. They let you build circuits. And there's a whole class of them that are flexible, that have really become, I would say, popularized as a thing that you can get made over the past couple of years. The LED light strips that became popular within the past decade, let's say, those are almost always printed on flexible LED strips. So the, the LEDs themselves are soldered onto a flexible LED strip, just like what's shown here. That's the LED is the square. Then there's some resistors and things, and then the conductors are going through that flexible plastic tape. So that's a system that has become a standard. It's often used for LED strips. That's by far the most common place for them. Uh, but they, they actually fit really nicely in wearables because they're able to move. 
sometimes they're able to move more in one dimension than another, but if you're planning the right way for a, for a project, that can be totally fine. And then the most iconic of those is this wearables down here. This is what we're gonna get pretty close to with our goal this week, is to take a circuit board like this. This is an Adafruit um, Flora, it looks like. And then this is a GPS module up here on the top, on the top of the lapel. And then down a little bit lower, those are sewable pixels. So they're on small circular circuit boards. Those are NeoPixels that are stitched together with conductive thread. That's the direction that we're gonna try this week to think about wearable electronics because the wires become very visible, the concepts of it become very clean and neat. And then none of the circuit boards are ever very large and bulky so that they generally can stay out of your way. So that if you wanna hide them, uh, like for example, this, this um, flora is on the back of that lapel. So when wearing the jacket the right way, you would never see that flora on the jacket. You just see the GPS modules and the LEDs. And I don't know what they're trying to do with that. I didn't, I guess I didn't research that photo that I found any deeper than just there it is. Uh, but it's probably like something related to their location, just generally because this is a GPS module and then those are LEDs. So I can imagine they programmed it to light up a different way when they're at home or when they're at work or when they're at a certain specified location. So those are what? It could be, it could totally just be indicating, could you, could you use your GPS right now? Which might be, in, or like how many satellites are you connected to in that moment? Could be a really interesting question also. Uh, because those just connect, they listen for satellites telling them the time. And so if you know that, you sort of understand that, what a neat piece of art to have on your lapel for, oh, I'm connected to, to six satellites or to one satellite, and then how that would change as you walk through a city. It would be really cool. Yeah, yes, it takes, five is for 3D positioning. You can do 2D positioning with three of them. But it's, yeah, I did an interesting project where kids made GPS motion trackers and we took them on roller coasters to map out their position over the ride. It was fun. Um, but there, there's lots of depth to that. But as you think about circuits, right, we try and put that in a context that here's this slide that maybe should have been a little earlier. When you think about circuits in general, regardless of how you solder them together, you should think about them as water flowing through a series of pipes, right? And so the analogy over here is that you have a battery. This is the battery symbol. Uh, a battery would be like a water ladder or a pump over here where it's raising that water up in the system. It gives it a little energy. And so then the water would move around in sort of a top rail. Uh, there's a big um, water slide ride at Cedar Point where you go up a big ramp, you sort of loop around and then you fall down a big hill. I don't know if they have those sorts of water slide rides here in Connecticut. I, I'm assuming somewhere there is a, a water park. Yeah. A what? Lake Wasi. Quasi. That sounds very New Englandy. So, uh, as as you come as the water comes up to the top, it's got some energy. It's got the ability to fall down that waterfall, and so the battery adds energy to this circuit. Right? It's the piece that raises the water. Without the battery, the water wouldn't get up there on its own. It needs the battery as a pump to push the electricity up, to push the water up. And then in the wires themselves, if, a wi if you imagine a wire is a perfect conductor, and they never are, and then conductive thread is even less so. Uh, but if you imagine a wire is a pretty good conductor, it doesn't use up much of the energy. In, a, in one of those water slide rides, you're gonna have a slight pitch down, but not much of a pitch down when you're at the top. And so you're going around the top there, and then this drop is where you have your load, is what this is often called. The load of a circuit is where it actively does the thing you want it to do, right? And so in the case of this example circuit, you have the pump, which is the battery, and the load, which might be an LED or a motor or, or a heater. And so you should often think about the battery as pumping up the energy, it's adding voltage, and then the load uses that energy, it uses the other half. And then once the load uses the energy, it just sort of circles back, maybe with a slight downward pitch to the, to the hill or to the, to the water, but not much. It, that it's pretty much flat and you don't need a lot to just coast. Most of the energy added is in the battery and used is in the resistor. There's obviously many, many more layers of abstraction and complexity that can be added, but that's a good one. A parallel circuit you can imagine having three or four waterfall options where you could choose to go down one of the several. 
And a series waterfall system like this would be like a waterfall, and then it goes flat, and then another waterfall, and it goes flat, and another waterfall. Right? So in parallel, you'd have multiple options you could choose from, and in series, you'd go through a series of waterfalls in a row without a sort of choices. Um, this analogy has been around for a long time. This is the classic example that I've seen in many different textbooks. I don't know where this comes from, but I've seen this image itself in several different books. So you've got a pump down here, which is your battery system. It pushes water through. You get up to here, it will load this up. This might be a capacitor. You can even imagine in an example. And then it'll come down through here. A valve at this point would shut off the cycle, right? So a valve would be like a switch where you can turn the circuit on and off. So you can have control there. And so valves and resistors and capacitors, they all have their role in a circuit. We won't need to get into lots of that this week. We're mostly gonna think about just batteries and LEDs or resistors. So we're gonna think about batteries and loads and then how those circuits are arranged. In this last one, you can see that they have this sort of drawn up um, a little bit. It's, it's a sort of a strange image, but they're giving you that this water is draining out through a, a valve piece and there's a battery and then a current. And then if this valve were shut off, the current would stop flowing. Right, so if you shut off the valve, your current will stop. Up here is another one. I love these old time diagrams, but you've got a pump that's right here, a centrifugal pump, and then you've got a current of water that's coming back into here, and that loop could go continuously pumping the water through the same cycle. Without losing or gaining any, it would just keep looping. As long as the pump's going, it'll keep going. So thinking about water as the way that current flows through a wire is gonna be really helpful for you this week as you're imagining what circuit you wanna build and how you'd like to put it together. So the water analogy is something that we're often, that I'm gonna talk about a lot with you as you're planning this. And when you look at the analogies, if we were to hop back over to that crash course slide that pretty much stopped Google Slides, the DC current video is all based around a river, right? So the, the prospect or the idea of current as a flowing body of water is almost universal when you teach this. So it's, it's really, and I talked to Cedric, who's taught this probably in French before, and he uses the water analogy. Uh, there's lots of different places and people, and many people refer back to the flowing electric charge as similar to a flowing water in a pipe or in a river. So with that, a uh, really useful thing to think about that I think is often overlooked in high school science is the faucet or the, the switch in a circuit. So we're gonna imagine things that switch on and off. It's gonna be really useful for you. If, you. if you're building LEDs into something and you want it to light up, you probably won't want it to always only be lit up, right? And if you build a circuit based around a battery pack and you don't build in a switch, the only way to turn it off will be to disconnect the battery, right? And that can work just fine, but a lot of the time a switch is a really useful element to turn something on and off easily. So we've got these knife switches which expose a metal to metal the connection. These knife switches are really cool old timey switches. They're like Dr. Frankenstein switches where you make big electrical connections. They can handle lots of current. They work really well for that. Uh, and th they look kind of mean, right? It's a good Halloween sort of look. But they, they do a great job physically showing the metal to metal connections that make a current happen. In a home or in, and this is a really old time sort of switch, but in other switches, that's a little bit more hidden from view. But the main point of a switch in any form factor is it's a convenient way to connect or disconnect a circuit. And so it's a lot like a faucet, but the, the diagram for a switch is actually just this, where you've got a line and then sort of like a gate that swings. And a, when you think about a, a switch like a gate, it works a lot like a fence. A circuit is then a lot like a fence in an analogy. A fence will work to keep your sheep in a good friend of mine is a shepherd. A fence will keep your sheep in if it's closed, but it won't work if it's open. And so an open switch or an open circuit isn't working. A closed switch is, is going to work, just like a closed gate would work to keep the, the sheep in the, in the pen. So a switch like this can be really useful, and the great analogy is a faucet. They work on the exact opposite things. An open faucet works and a closed faucet doesn't, but you get the idea. They're an, a chance to turn things on and off all together. And so in that water analogy, if you can imagine water running through pipes, a switch or a faucet will let you turn the water on and off just like a switch would let you turn, turn the flow on and off.
So if we come back to this picture of series in parallel, we can imagine just a bunch of faucets added into these circuits or a bunch of switches. And so in this case of, well, let's look at the series one first. In a series circuit where you've got just this one path to go from the batteries, these are each a load. When you're going through here, the switch lets you turn on and off all of those loads together. You have one path for current, and if you interrupt it, the whole thing doesn't work. Put another way, if this was a fence, and the batteries you kind of imagine closed, uh, if this was a fence and that gate was left open, it wouldn't be working. The sheep could just get right out. But if you close that fence, then you've got a full connection that goes all the way around, and that's going to be a working circuit. And so that works for a circuit overall. And you can come over here and look at the one by the battery also. That still works. If you cut off the battery, the whole thing shuts off. But then you can imagine switches at a more granular level, where if I close this switch, then this one turns on. And if I close that switch, then that one turns on. And if Sorry, I close this switch. With your head's blocking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I close this switch, then this load would be turned on. If I close this switch, that load would be turned on. And this one here at the top will close and turn on that switch. So I could have more fine tuned control about what's turned on and what's turned off by adding in more switches. And if we get to a smarter device, when we get to Arduino eventually or we get to other microcontrollers, you're going to have 8, 12, or, or more ways to switch things on and off. And when you have multiple, the ability to switch multiple things on and off, you'll be able to do that fine tuned control and build out displays that you want to build. So being able to switch things on and off is a core element of what we're going to be doing. More than, than doing calculations, more than doing uh, sort of the academic work of circuits, most of what we're going to be focused on is can you turn it off and on? And can you turn it off and on fast enough? In fact, what we'll find, and we're not going to do it this week, but if you can turn an LED on and off in a very fine-tuned sort of way, you can set its brightness. If it's all the time on, then it's on full brightness. If it's on and off half the time, it'll look half as bright. And if it's on and off spike cycling repeatedly, but you can get it so only 25% of the time it's on, it'll look 25% its brightness. As long as you switch it faster than you could see the switching happening. Sort of like in a, in a movie, the frames pass by really quickly and your brain stitches that together. We'll get to that. That's pulse width modulation. It's a whole thing we'll get to eventually. Um, but being able to switch things on and off is mostly what we're going to be focused on as we work through this. So is there any questions about how these switches are different? That this one would shut off all three of those and then these would shut on and off individually? I just want to pause and ask because it's an important thing globally. OK. Anybody remote? No, we good? OK, nobody unmuted. So I think we're good. So then another important detail, that in addition to the switch where you can have planned things turning on and off, another important piece, and you've probably heard it before, is a short circuit. So you can plan for places for circuits to turn on and off, but then there's also the accidental turning on and off. A short circuit is a place where you get things crossed. And in the case of our sewn circuits this week, that would be where your conductive threads touch and maybe they shouldn't have, right? Where they're touching right next to the battery, but they were supposed to stay separated. You can get a short circuit and electricity is like the rest of us. It's as lazy as it can be to do the work that it needs to do. So it's going to take the path of least resistance. And in the case of the series circuit, if you have a short like a wire that's just laying across here where it's connected in a place where it shouldn't be. In this circuit, you'd have energy coming out of the battery, going through this first load, going through the second load, and these lights might be turned on. But then this short circuit means that the current would go that way, and almost none of it would go back through that third bulb. So that third bulb would be turned off. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be on because the current can go this shorter path, and it wouldn't go through that longer one. So that's a short circuit. In that case, it's a relatively harmless thing. You've got two out of the three lights on. It's no big deal. The problem with short circuits is that they can often be much more dangerous. The, the terrible example is the toaster in the bathtub, right, where you've got a short circuit supplied by water, and then you can get electricity flowing through all of that water. And in this example, in the parallel, we've done basically that. And I've certainly built many circuits where I go to, I've soldered them all up, I've put them together, everything should work. 
and then I turn them on and I get a big puff of smoke and something melts in front of me. It's going to happen. I suggest that you get emotionally prepared for that to occur to you. It will be a thing. Uh, and don't worry, it's a part of learning this. As long as it's not any damage to you or a giant loss of cash, you're fine. It's probably actually a good informative part of this experience. Uh, I would actively encourage, encourage every one of you to deliberately blow up an LED at some point just by running too much current through it. It's a really, it's like a, a necessary formative part of getting better at circuits. Yeah, yeah, if you just connect the battery without the resistor or you connect an LED without any resistance, not so much with this CR2032s, they can't put out enough current, uh, but a bigger supply, you can totally fry an LED if you don't put a resistor on it. Um, but in this case, for this parallel circuit, with this short right here, if you trace this out from the battery, I come through here and this is the shortest path to get back to the battery. There's no load between the battery top and bottom end. And so in this case, this is a worst case scenario short circuit. And it could be from any one of these prior to the load. It doesn't matter that it's the first one, but that would be a very short circuit. And in that case, you could get a runaway current where it's just delivering current as fast as the battery's chemistry can deliver it. So it could get hot, it could start to melt things. That's where you're gonna get the smoke and, and uh, and in some cases you can get fire, where if the wires get hot enough, they will actually heat up the things around, you can get some sink in. If you do that through components, through integrated circuits, you'll often get what's called the, the magic blue smoke, which is just like a faintly blue smoke with an ozone smell to it, yep. And so if you've got that, the ozone, a whiff of ozone out of an integrated circuit, you, you have joined the ranks of makers. It's not a good thing, don't breathe it in, but it's just one of those things that's gonna happen over the course of your experience. Um, so thinking about short circuits and keeping track of those is gonna be an important part of how you sew together your circuit. And there's actually some good examples of how to avoid those and how you'd wanna wire them up that we can look at in, well, let's look at it now, actually. Um, escape, and then we're just gonna hop over to here. You still able to see everything, JR? Cool. We're going to zoom, whoa, we're going to zoom way in. Okay. So down here, this is the example of the circuit that we're going to be building. These are slightly different LEDs and slightly different battery clip. Uh, but in this case, these LEDs are wired up in parallel. I would strongly recommend you watch this video. But the positive side of the battery is connected out this way. And it goes there along the LEDs. The negative side comes out here and it's stoned this way. And importantly, it's put together in such a way that you shouldn't have any sort of short circuit, right? At no point do those threads cross each other and touch in a way that they would be able to make contact without flowing through an LED. That's gonna be an important part of how you design what you're building this week, just so that you think about not getting those wires to cross, uh, which are just a piece of thread. So it'll be a little bit tricky, but it's definitely something that you wanna take into account is you're gonna wanna plan out your circuit so that you design it to avoid short circuits. It's probably gonna be the most common problem this week when you're making those plans. But let's hop back over. I have a, so, have a fast, fast question. question. Absolutely. So, so I, I, guess I guess when, when I, I, know I know that, that I'm an idiot, idiot when it comes to things, things I, don't I don't understand, understand, understand and, I'm and I'm anticipating I'm going, going to burn or break something, right? right? That's exciting. Uh, but but yeah, it is that exciting. Is but but when, when I have it on a piece of clothing, clothing is something that I'm wearing. Um, um, I, guess I guess if there's, if there's any, any sort of resources, resources that might that help, help us, us sort of like, I don't know, I would love to have like a checklist or something, something that, that I could that use to be like, I've done my due diligence to like put this on my body and like burn myself. Or if I do, it's fine. Something like that would be cool. I don't know if such a resource might exist. Yes, we can. So the video that I was just showing off is like a tutorial on how to do this exact thing. So it's got all the checklist stuff that you'd need. I would solidly recommend you watch it. We also made some smart decisions in choosing CR2032 batteries and the LEDs that we have. A CR2032 essentially can't supply enough current. It's just too wimpy of a battery to give enough current that you would burn or hurt yourself that way. The, the battery will, will destroy itself before it does anything damaging to you. So we made that choice to be actively safe in this first, you know, in your first foray into circuits. Since it is something that's going to be so close to the skin, you'll, you would 
we, we want to keep you safe. And so CR2032s matched with batteries are a very safe way to go. Um, yeah, what's up? Does it matter what cloth? The, uh, does, the question is, does it matter what cloth? And, like, do you need to layer it so oh. it doesn't touch you? And do you need to layer it so it doesn't touch you? So the, those are great questions. And so I would say definitely you want to think about layers so that you don't have the thread touch each other. So as a set of spacing. However, the amount of current that you're passing is very, very low, and your skin itself is very resistive. So you can have the, the threads right up against your skin, and it shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, th so that's, a, that's an interesting piece. If you wanted a layer of fabric underneath just as, a, you know, as an extra barrier, go for it. It's not going to do any harm. But um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but I would totally pop one of these batteries in my mouth just to showcase they're pretty safe. Like you're not going to, these are safe enough that you're not going to hurt yourself with them. Uh, you should feel comfortable doing this. There's a lot of people that ask that question. I will often, you know, in pre-COVID times, I would dare a senior every year to stick a nine volt battery on their tongue. And if you've ever done that, you know that you get a little tingle, but that's it. Like there's some, there's some batteries that are safer to do that. You would never want to do that with a lead acid battery. So, so in some batteries, they'll like weld terminals together, but we've specifically chosen ones that can't do that to you so that you don't have that worry this week. I'll also be happy to guide you at any moment so that you're, you're choosing things that are safe enough for what you're working on. And if you ever have a question about a safety piece like that, never ever hesitate to ask because I'm happy to answer and give you some feedback um, and, that's, and that's really where the calculations part can come in and be helpful so that you can do the math for how much current are you passing, where is it going, what's the power draw, all of those sorts of questions are where you'd want to have the math to inform you instead of like, this is going to be enough or not enough or having it based on a feeling, being able to do the calculations can be really helpful. So all of that is, is hopefully there. 100% would recommend watching that video that I just put on screen because it's a great way to get a tutorial about all of this example. So uh, all that said, let's talk about some of the modern commercial wearables that are all, all over the place. There's tons of them that exist. There's lots of good examples. And so it's just good for us to see what's happening. There are some futurists that talk about what about our robot overlords that are coming in the future. And instead of saying that, yes, those are coming, they say that we're instead just integrating them into ourselves. And wearables are probably how that's happening. So, there's lots of different examples. Uh, headphones people wear around all the time. Uh, my students will wear AirPods like their earrings and constantly never take them out, uh, which is annoying, actually. I don't know if you know any teenagers, but there are many who will never take out AirPods, uh, which just my age, th to me, that's, yeah, anyways, mo moving on. Uh, Apple Watch, if you have a, a watch of any kind, even if it's one of the older, like I have an old watch, uh, I like this one. It's a G-Shock. It's electrically and vibrationally insulated. So I haven't electrocuted this watch yet. Um, although I've killed many wristwatches from being electrocuted, um, which is, you know, just a part of when you're doing house wiring, not play circuit wiring. That's a thing that can happen if you're not great at it. Um, but smart watches or dumb watches, they all are wearable electronics at a very real level. And so you've got those things. The Apple Watch up here has got these sensors that, that point back into your skin that can even measure things about you while you're wearing it. You've got this, which is a fossil hybrid watch, uh, where it is a classic looking watch, but it's got smart insides and it can move the, it can move the hands around based on if you get a message. And so it'll, if, you, if the hands move to like the two o'clock position, you know mom just texted you. You can set up some of those settings in some smartwatches where they don't quite look like smartwatches. Um, a cell phone is arguably a wearable, right? Mine is in my pocket at all times. And so you could make a case that that would be a thing that we wear that extends our ability to think and imagine. Uh, AirPods themselves, there's those crazy calculator watches that have been around for a long time since the 80s. There's the, the slightly less watch-like Fitbits that just track your motion. All of these are wearables in some way, that they're worn by a person, that they interact with your body perhaps, or that they're just useful enough that you carry them around all the time. And, and in that way, these are electronics that have built themselves into a niche, or people have built into a niche of symbiosis with people, right? Wristwatches 
uh, have their, it's, I forget the term, but there's like, a, there's an entire branch of study around wristwatches. And there's lots of different pieces that people have integrated. And then you, you've even got those Bluetooth speakers. That's the, I think that's the Xbox one down at the bottom, but a Bluetooth headset so you can be connected to people around the world to talk to them at a moment's notice. And as weird as it may look to walk around with a Bluetooth headset in all the time, it can be very, very useful. Uh, in the right context. So all of those pieces are definitely commercially available wearables that, that are based around circuits and that connection and making all of that work together. So these are definitely commercial applications of all of these pieces in a real sense. This is a video I actually want to watch. So it may be a test to see if the audio works and we're gonna find out if it does in just a second. Uh, but this, this video, is of a dance troupe that has used EL wire, which is what's on my backpack and what's on the jacket that I'm gonna show off in just a minute. EL wire is a conductive uh, material. It's basically a big capacitor that glows when it's got a changing voltage applied. And so when, when you've got that sort of a material, they've turned it into an entire dance suit so that the dancers can move around and light up. And then they build that custom controller so they can bounce on and off all those lights to rhythm and with the music. So we're gonna try it with the sound and see if this works. <laughs> it's four minute, hold on. Do we have any, any hope of sound? Um, I have to change the input. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you can say no. Yeah, that, not unless it's really worth waiting two minutes. Uh, probably not. So let's, let's just play this video. Uh, but you can see that these dancers are totally moving around. They're able to do this. You can see that they light up on command. Those are all people that are standing there. It's not like a person being moved. And so there's people able to dance. Those suits, you can see the strings of light up wire. And they're able to control when and how they turn on and off in zones across the body and in different places. But these are the suits with EL wire baked into them. Uh, so they're going to talk a little bit about the project and how it works and how do they sew them together? How do they design all these circuits? And I would strongly recommend you watch this video as well. It's a great example of one of these suits and how they're used. And when put into the right context, you can get a, a really amazing view of how this all plays together. So this is a great example of a wearables project taken to a deep level. Here she's walking through the process of how you solder that together. And if you wanted to buy and use EL wire, it's totally something that you can get. And she's showing that you solder it together in interesting ways, using copper tape and a few other materials. Uh, but for this dance troupe, they build, well, we're gonna go back to it in a second. They put together all of this in a way that they have a suit that's full body, gives them the look that they want. And by timing it, they can have a really nice show. They have been on, on one, not, America's Got Talent, but one of those sorts of shows is where I first saw them. And so they've got lots of exposure. They have many millions of followers on YouTube, I think. And so it's a great uh, application of these wearable tech pieces. And the, the dancers, the artists are interested in how the science works. The scientists are responding to what the dancers say they wanna do. It's an interesting symbiosis of those two people. There's the controller pack. Uh, they say that they've had to upgrade that, that they have to build custom controllers. And usually the deeper you get into an application, the more you want to have a sense of how exactly it works. Like in the application of this jacket or my backpack, I don't need to know that it's fundamentally a capacitor that this EL wire is working as, but these people who are developing high end applications, they need to know the subtleties of this and how do you apply it and power it at that sort of a scale and how do you plan it? How do you control it? And how do you work with it, given the fact that it has some constraints? Like you can't dim these lights. They're only on or off and that's it. There's no like in between on them. Uh, but it does give some really interesting dynamics and you can see there, they're sort of troubleshooting through the, the process of what they're working on. So there's lots to go with there. Would solidly recommend you watch the whole thing. But since the sound isn't working, we're not gonna stick with it. And so we'll just click on to the next slide. But here are other great examples. These. Uh, wearables often get their way into costumes for Halloween or for professional theater. So there's lots of examples here, and I've totally worn these for Halloween costumes, for school spirit activities, for whatever it is that you want to do. 
these wearables are becoming more and more commonplace and getting garments that light up is going to become more common. Shirts with lights in them have been around and available even at like Kohl's or JCPenney or any of those sorts of stores for a while where you can get them, they light up to sound or they light up to music or if you watched um, Westworld, there was a character that wore a shirt that showed their mood all the time in the latest season. There's lots of examples of shirts that will light up and garments that do. But as this becomes cheaper and more accessible and the flexible circuit boards have come into vogue, there's gonna be more and more applications of this. And if you're really interested in that fashion front end, this is something to think about. Wearable electronics have made it into Fashion Week in New York multiple times, and they're becoming more and more common as the years go on. So it's definitely something that's going to hit mainstream at some point uh, as it becomes more possible, as it becomes more integrated. And if you wanna get out on the front of that, Go for it. This is the place to do it. So, um, next up. No, nope, don't don't play the video. Slide 23. You can do it. So, DIY wearables. And this is something that's interesting. Wearables is a category of electronics. Um, and there are people who are so deep in these weeds that they talk about wearable shirts. I love this quote, because every shirt is wearable. Um, but it's a wearable if it's a class of electronics that you wear, right? And so it's, it's kind of funny that a person would get tied up in wearable shirts. It's just like a, an odd quirk of the terminology in this field. But the short thing that I want to say is you can wear most small electronics. Most small electronics at, at any level, whether it's a rigid circuit board or whether it's EL wire or whether it's something else, you can usually wear them. Uh, just because you can strap them to your body and it will work. I've carried around very bizarre things uh, that have been attached as a Halloween costume. I left it in Ohio, but I made a proton pack. I can find a photo and put it on the Slack Foundations channel. I made a Ghostbusters proton pack that lit up and moved around. It had a big proton gun to go with it, and I wore it to school for Halloween multiple years in a row. Uh, because when you put that much effort in, you deserve to wear it multiple years in a row. But, the, but it was a large, heavy metal thing that I was carrying around as a backpack and like as a, as a fake ray gun. And so those are all things that are really important. But in general, my one, my one like rule of thumb is that I would say if you're gonna do a wearables project, a good place to start is to try and stay under 12 volts and under one amp of current. So if you're doing that math, you're trying to see how that goes, that's about where I feel comfortable as a max, just carrying something around that's on and running near my body. Uh, that's, that's my like personal limit. There's certainly, if you're building a jetpack to lift yourself up off the ground, which no one's doing this week, please, um, then you're gonna have a lot more power than that. But there's, this is a good starting rule of thumb limit. Unless you know what you're doing, I wouldn't try and go for more than that. There's definitely more pieces to take into account. My other rule of thumb is never break the skin with your wearable electronics. There are people that are happy to break that rule for biohacking. When we open up the bio room, that's I'm sure a, a ground rule JR is gonna have to set uh, about no electrodes into yourself. Because once you break the skin, you lose that giant resistive skin organ and you're inside the squishy bits that are very conductive. Um, so that's a, a good rule. And then there's lots more that you can read in this read more link. That's actually linked to uh, a PubMed article about the resistivity of body tissues in case you're curious about how electricity conducts through your own body. Um, but wearables very often do better when they follow these guidelines, if you at all can. There are plenty of counterexamples, but things that are bendable, that are generally low power or run on batteries instead of needing to be plugged in. Although if you're looking at like the animatronic legs that they're adding to soldiers for like very, being able to lift things or being able to run or, or carry stuff that's very heavy. As of right now, those are almost all still plugged in as prototypes. But having batteries is a great example. Something that you could run with a simple interface. Interfaces for wearables are often tricky. If you have or have played with an Apple Watch, you may know that the interface is a little clunkier than the iPhone. It's not bad. They've come a long way from what they first were. But having simple interfaces is usually really important on uh, a wearable. Like on my watch, there are five buttons and that feels like just about too many. One of them is just to light it up, but it's still five buttons might be too much on most watches. Uh, another thing that's really important for wearables is that they're built with some sturdiness in mind, with an ability 
to handle the elements. And so you want to think about building a robustness, building in some strength. Uh, I've built EL wire applications in the past with lots of solder joints. And by the end of one night, it failed. But this, this jacket that I'm wearing and I'll show in a minute has got one solder joint in it and it's been working for years. So thinking about how to build a robustness into your design is a really important part of that. And then another piece, especially if you've got a smart device, is can it handle intermittent outages of power or intermittent outages of any signal that it needs to run? What happens if it needs to reset on the fly? Is it, if you're building motors onto yourself for like animatronic wings near your head, if it has to reset all of a sudden, is it gonna smack you in the side of the head with those wings? Or is it built so that they, they start off calm and then slowly raise and lower? Like all of those are things that you might have to think about if you're considering a wearable sort of suit. But there are tons of resources. This is a growing field with lots of info. This is literally just a screenshot of Wikipedia. So uh, there's an entire wearable technology section in Wikipedia. I would recommend you take a look. There's tons of different categories and subcategories and linked articles. Very much recommend you take a look at that. But then if you want to find examples of wearables, if you don't want to follow the the sort of prescribed project that we're going to recommend, which is five sequin LEDs and a battery. If you want to go your own, I would still recommend you look at examples for inspiration. So just on screen with the first page of a Google search and then the very top of wearables on Adafruit, we've got you know eight examples from Adafruit and then another eight or more from Google. There's tons and tons of examples in this space it's becoming a very popular section of, intersect, of, of uh, intersecting interest in electronics and in textiles. So people are interested in what they can do here. Young, you can imagine young uh, fashion students are trying to figure this out so they can show up since this has started to become popular in the New York fashion scene. And then it's just an interesting place to live, right? You've got this uh, light up name tag that can be useful or an I voted tag. You've got uh, light up mask here for the light up chatty circuit. You can imagine like a, a pendant or a brooch that would light up, which could be a lot of fun. If you, if you had it like a best friend pendant and if it could sense another one was nearby, they'd both light up. That would be a lot of fun and sort of heartwarming, right? There's, there's many examples of cases where you can do interesting stuff and some of them are even assistive. So like the gloves down at the bottom, you can imagine controlling and having feedback with different systems. So you can build in interactions through gloves and other things so that, so that they get things to work. I, I have seen a high schooler who built uh, an, an arm sleeve that they wore on their own arm to control a robot arm upside down. So the robot arm was built this way and they built their like sleeve to go this way. So they were just the upside down version of a robot arm, which was really cool. And it used the motion of their arm to control the robot in a way that kind of blew my mind and I wondered who built that and really was it the kid or was it their parent either way it's still impressive uh, I just wanted to talk to whoever really knew what was going on there so there's a lot of interesting things Corey? That, yeah sure that we just right now on how do we get that the Adafruit wearables gallery oh uh the Adafruit wearables gallery I will send a direct link but the, if you go to the Adafruit and then search wearables, it's an entire subsection. But I'll definitely send a link out through Foundation's, the, the class chat. So it'll come through there. But if you just search like the wearables, if you go to Adafruit and they've got that search bar at the top, you type in wearables, you should get, you should get that. With 244 guides and 1400 pages. So there's lots and lots of info about wearables on Adafruit and across the web. It's so also probably, probably worth saying, saying that they've just, just got, got a bunch of stuff, stuff in stock. stock. I've been oh, like, yeah. all, all over it over the last week, week waiting, waiting for uh, one, of one of those kits, kits the Flora, Flora kit, kit, to come in stock. stock. Yep, yeah, it's, that's it's worth there. saying for sure. And then Adafruit sells, they also resell through Amazon, which is an encouraged route. They, they sell through their own website and through Amazon. So both of those, they have separate stock, uh, I believe. So you can check either way and order that through them if you wanted to order anything. But again, if you wanted to just come in and pick up the stuff that we have for you, we have that as well. But if you're interested in anything to go a little deeper or try and explore a little further, you totally can. Um, 
So yeah. Yeah, what's up? Um, but you might have seen like super low power night lights. That, that's essentially an EL panel, which is plugged into the wall power. But this is just an EL wire that's sewn on with a sewing machine onto the back of this jacket. And all I did was come up with a nice template that was the school logo in the shape of the, the power cat. And then it's all sewn in through there. And if I take it off, you can see that it's just like one continuous loop that, and we're still waiting on that to go. But on the inside, it's one continuous loop with a couple of loops in through there. And it's just got the one solder joint right there that I didn't even, this is like the factory done solder joint. I didn't even disconnect it. I just used the standard clip that it came with and then sewed it in place for how I wanted it to look on this side. The sewing job when you get real up close isn't the greatest, but most of the time when people are looking at this jacket, they're not like three inches away. They're, they're several feet away. Um, I would wear this to like, oh, yeah, there you go. So there, that's the, the jacket. And then over here on the back, you can sort of, maybe it's hard to see through the camera, but the stitching and the loops come through. There's several places where that was just practical to try and make it work with one continuous loop. So I sort of planned that out in advance and then just use a sewing machine with a bunch of curves to try and use a zigzag stitch to put that down where I wanted it to go. The only solder joint is this right over here and that was a factory done solder joint. So I didn't even solder that. And then there's a clip to disconnect the battery and the battery pack is just this little thing that I keep in the pocket. Oh, you got to get real close. And so on the sewing machine, it's just a zigzag stitch right over the EL wire. So it's, it would be hard to see on camera. I would love to show it, but I'll send a picture in a minute. Um, but it's just a zigzag stitch on the sewing machine right over the EL wire. It was like the edge of what my sewing machine could do, um, but it was it was worth it. Um, it did a really good job of like rolling off the sides cause it's got like a hard plastic casing. So it worked pretty well for that actually. Did you go pretty slow? I went really slow. Uh, it took a long time. I did it as meticulously as I could and I was not good at sewing. I wanted to put in like stitched edge buttonholes for every place that it pierced through the jacket, but it didn't work. I just like ended up cutting holes and then hoping that it held together. I should have, but didn't even know that was a thing at the time. <laughs> so I was very bad at stitching. I've gotten much better since Megan showed me everything I did wrong. Uh, and I would feel better doing it now. Yo. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's a good, that's a good point. How did I hold the design while stowing? I went through and did a few stitches by hand to like loosely hold it together. And then I would just, and I marked it out with a fabric, like white mark thing. Um, and then I would just hold it in the right spot as I did the sewing machine, but it was a lot of just barely working. And a, it was a lot of focus to make that happen. It was me in a quiet room with only enough lights on, like no one interrupting me. It was a, it was a task of focus for sure. Um, but it's but it's a neat one. It's really neat to be able to put that kind of a design onto a jacket and get it to be You know, it was, it was an iconic thing to wear to school because it was the only one of its kind So that that's the sort of fun that that can, you can really get with a wearables That's a good well-made project and that's not even super well made, but it's it's good enough for what it is, right? I have people who were definitely willing to pay me to make more and it was just like too torturous of a task to try and do um, But it was great to have one all right, so back to here, whoops. Oh, that's, that was a link also. Um, so here's this, going through these. Oh, we're back, okay. So project ideas. So let's, let's talk about some project ideas in general. And I wanna hear some from you instead of just from me, like what are your thoughts that you've had? How do we spin those up into real ideas that would be actionable? And sometimes even if it's not what you're gonna do this week, it's good to just have that discussion to sort of imagine what's going on and to have a little bit of back and forth. Um, oh, but we are way over for time. <laughs> but let's still, let's still have some. Um, what's up? I have a shirt that has sort of like individual floodlights on it. Let me see. I don't know if I can share it, but um, I was wondering, it looks like it would be very easy to do. I just sent it 
in your Slack direct messages, so we'll talk after, I guess. Cool. Yeah, we can we can totally talk after. Um, and yeah, I see those I see those floodlights. So we need to put LEDs on each one of them. So that that's cool. If you have like a shirt or a design that's like begging to light up, it can be really neat. And sometimes it's easier than you'd expect to just throw an LED behind it or right on top of it, and then you get it to glow just the way you want. Um, there's lots of good examples. I've, up here, I've got watches, dresses, jewelry, handbags, jackets, and masks. Anybody have an idea that's generally related to these about wearables that you're interested in, that you've thought about, that you wanna that you wanna talk about? I would think that for the winter, having a heated mask. <laughs> oh yeah, a heated mask would totally be great. You got lots of lots of lots of warm that you wanna have for sure. Oh yeah, I did. I did drop these. So there's ton there's tons of good options. Um, anybody had other ideas over the course of the week? I know that lots of you are thinking about wearables and ideas like that. Always. Always. I've got, I've got one. one. It's, it's, it's kind of, kind of uh, uh, I mean, it's I mean, not it's too not exciting, exciting, but I, I bought, I bought uh, uh, a, sports a sports team hat. hat. I'm not a big, not a big sports, sports person, person, but when I really, I really needed a hat when I was in Michigan, and, and I'd, I'd like, like to, to sew a patch over, over it, and the hat is sturdy enough um, and, and has, has the sort of like lip, lip to it that I thought I could hide a bunch of electronics in it. So I thought it'd be fun to stitch some EL wire, wire on it. Um, um, and, and if it, it if it doesn't, doesn't come out perfectly, out perfectly, I won't mind. It'll be you know my my, my, my first pretty, pretty mess. mess. So oh, that's so, yeah. That's totally a great idea. There's also um, EL panels that exist where instead of like a strip, it's like a a wider panel or a ribbon. So you can get EL wire in, in a few different formats to make that happen. So if you're interested in like, a, I've seen really good examples on Adafruit where they use the panel to make like the star for Converse on a shoe light up. Cause you've got a little bit of space under like the tongue of the shoe where you could hide a tiny battery pack and then the EL panel on the side makes the star light up on the shoe. Uh, so that, that's kind of, those are fun options. I would recommend you, you try out some of those. Those are totally cool. Oh, that'd be so fun. <laughs> oh, the, Jamie wants to make, make, uh, make their old man a night bright yarmulke. So it lights up and you can move around the things. That would be tons of fun. <laughs> to just like draw out whatever design you feel like doing. That would be great. Um, up here I've got more other examples. This is a fiber optic fabric. And it's gonna be really hard to see in the light but it's got this like end with fiber optics. It's like a fiber optic holiday tree, right? Like fiber optic Christmas tree where you've got this end where all of these tubes, they run through. And if you light it up with my cell phone that I pulled out for this purpose, um, you can get a, a light to shine down through here. So flashlight down through there. And it's a little hard to see, but it, it definitely sparkles. And so all of the electronics are consolidated in one spot, but you can totally get a, a are you turn off the lights. Oh, that's great. So it's, it's able to sparkle just because light comes through all those fiber optics. So the electronics on this are actually pretty limited. It's just a light on one end, but you get all of that sparkling by the light coming through there. I'm actually trying, I think what I want to do is turn this into a, a mask cover so that I've got a mask and then this goes across the front so that my face would sparkle when, when I wanted it to, which would be a lot of fun, I think. Uh, this is fiber optic fabric and I have no, like, I got this years ago and haven't ever thought about a place to wear it or, or put it. Like I would imagine it would work really well in like a dress or in a jacket or a garment or in a scarf, like tied up in a scarf. Um, I was thinking about just a face mask for myself and then cutting it with like a big, um, cause usually the end of fiber optics are where they're the brightest. So like a big lightning bolt, David Bowie kind of lightning bolt deal across the, the front of the face would be a lot of fun. So you can find different materials like that that are really just like a gold mine and often a new material in wearables I think will really inspire a project. Um, so there's, there's tons of interesting things to have and take a look at there. Um, just keeping in, in mind our time, because we're way, way past where I thought we would be. Um, 
the suggested project is going to be five LED sequins. So everybody's going to get one of these with five LED sequins. And so if you're in the room, you can get those today. And otherwise, we can save them for you here somewhere. We'll put them on the, there's a, a brand new Make Haven Foundations of Fabrication shelf that will be in the back room. We'll put them there. And if you want to pick up your, if you want to store things, we have to share it like a bunch of good roommates. Uh, but we'll mark that shelf. We'll show you where it is in the back room because they're cleaning out the 48 hour table fastidiously. And so we may have more of a week long timeline that we work with for our shelf. Um, but we'll put all these things on that shelf so you can get access to them. You'll also get a battery pack. They don't come with wires on them. I soldered these on so that it became more sewable for little loops on the end. And I'll send out a picture of what this looks like. Uh, and then on Thursday for the, oh no, it needs to be soldered there again too. <laughs> so there's a little bit of soldering and a little bit of work that happens with these. And so I can help you solder all of that. It just broke right now. But the battery clip you'll get, and then you'll get a battery. And then we have some conductive thread um, that you can play around with also to use to make your piece conductive that you're sewing through. So if you want to make a light up glove, you know, if you're trying to make the, <laughs> the like mitten of uh, the Thor, oh God. Yeah, the Avengers guy. I just blanked out on his Thanos. name. Thanos. Thanos, you're trying to make the Thanos mitten. That would be a very possible thing this week. There's lots of options for what you could do with those five LEDs and a power source. Um, so there's tons of good projects that you could try and explore. We'll put all this stuff for you back on the the shelf in the back room of Make Haven, and I'll like maybe do a little video guide of how to get there from the front door and post that onto Foundations so you can see. We'll label it also. Um, those will be there. There'll be lots of other stuff like that. Um, but what I want to do just before we get too far on is I want to do a quick rapid fire show and tell over what happened over the past week with wearables and sewing and textiles and, and what happened. Because there's lots of interesting things that you were all doing. And a little bit we talked about with the tufting gun. Uh, but if anybody else has interesting things that they want to show off, I want to make sure that we have time for everybody to voice that as well. So um, the suggested project, I'm really saying, here's my tips before we get to the show and tell. These are my five things. And again, you should come back to these slides anytime that you want to. They are linked through the foundations page. But essentially, the, the combo of things that we're handing you, the CR2032 and the LEDs, they're really great because even though there's some quirks to getting them to work, it's really hard to kill either of them. So it's a really robust system. It's why it's a good first example, a good first foray into what's there. Um, you can practice with alligator clips, which are a great way to squeeze onto the contact points to practice all the circuits before you sew them into place. You can solder wire loops on, and I'll send a picture of that uh, so you can see what that looks like. And then you can think about ways to diffuse the LED light. It can often be a little bit harsh if it's just a bright light. So if you want to think about ways to diffuse that, like putting a cover over, that can be really helpful. And then how much like, do you want to actually show off? How, do you want to have all five? Do you want to just do one or two? Uh, like what's your, how much electronics do you want to show on your piece? Do you want to show off everything or do you want to try and find ways to hide the battery and just show the LEDs? Those are all interesting pieces. What's up? We've got to... That is a, a great question. And uh, so the question is, are there any electronics like resellers around here? And that's something that if we were in Cleveland, I would know exactly where to send you. But being in a new city, uh, JR, do you have any great suggestions on where to buy electronics stuff? Like uh, Arrow Electronics, DigiKey. Arrow, DigiKey, places online resellers. And Amazon will sell all of this stuff. I've bought, my Amazon history is bizarre. Um, and it ships in two days most of the time. So I real, if you're interested in something, if you want EL wire and you, you know that's what you're gonna do, buy it today, you'll have it by Wednesday, probably. So I would totally recommend if that's a way you wanna go, you give it a try. Adafruit also has expedited shipping. They are one of the re, they're, they're one of the like require, or one of the people that's helping with supplying materials for COVID still out of New York and so Anybody who's buying hobby electronics is a couple notches down on the list compared to the people who are buying for like PPE and that sort of stuff. Um, but it'll still like when I make orders to Adafruit and I made several over the past week or so, it comes within a couple of days. 
So um, there, there is that. But with that, I want to get on to the show and tell part so that it's not just me up here talking. So with that, um, anybody, how are we doing? Could we get somebody remote to be on pretty quickly or should we? Oh, OK. All right. So anybody remote want to go first with a little bit of show and tell time? Mm -hmm. I, can, I go. can go. Okay, great. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so in, in the, the Slack, Slack case, case like, like was saying, if anybody wanted to make the knitting needle holder, holder, I am currently working, working on that. Uh, I'm going to switch, switch my, my camera, camera around real quick. Hold on. And this is it. So, so right, right now, now it's, it's pretty much a study, study in sewing, sewing straight lines for these pockets. pockets. So that, so that they, they individually, individually fit each of the different knitting needles. needles. Um, so, so I finished my first row of, of for the, for po the po first pocket. pocket. And then now and there's, there's I have to work on the second pocket, pocket which goes down here, here for the shorter needles. needles. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think I, think I have, have about maybe like four, four more hours of work. work. Could, Could I, I ask, ask you something, something about, about that? that? Um, is the machine that you're using or whatever it is that you're using for that capable of taking a heavier, like a wax canvas? Because I would love to make like a chisel roll or a tool roll on the same principle. But um, I, I, when I tried to make one one time, it just went wet. I, I, I cut right through the material. So, so I, I would need, need to use something, something really, something really heavy. heavy. Um, so, the, so machine the machine that I used was the, uh, uh, it's, I guess it's vintage. vintage. Uh, the um, vintage, vintage Singer, Singer, the one that looks like it's from 1939. 1939. People, People have, have used, used that, that to sew leather. leather. And it's and so sewed pretty, pretty nicely, nicely through the canvas, canvas that I'm using, which is a duck canvas, which is a tighter weave. It did require some, some like, like certain, certain settings. settings like I had, like to, I had experiment to experiment with the settings. settings. I think, I think JR, JR saw me struggling with it on Thursday because it, it wasn't sewing, sewing properly. properly. So, so um, Megan, Megan, who's the facilitator, the facilitator for, one for one of the sewing, sewing facilitators, she helped, helped me figure out how to, how to get, get that machine running. running. But I think, I think that, that one would be your best bet for waxed wax canvas. Thank you. All right, anybody um, else remote who wants to go next? Like Ben, you're unmuted. You want to go? Uh, I'm happy to go. go. Um, um, this, this is, is the Chemex cozy, cozy that I made. made. Uh oh, oh man. Yeah. That's a nice picture. Cam, I just want to have this on my screen. Oh, oh no. no. Should we come back to you? We can come My back computer to you. didn't like, like being moved. Oh, there, there we go. go. So anyway, so I, made I made a very simple, simple um, like, like installation chemex cozy. Uh, and the challenges were just figuring out the right size for the pattern. I couldn't find the pattern online, so I did just take the measurements, but with the curves, it got a little complicated. And then it was also my first time selling a buttonhole, so that was an exciting uh, thing to learn how to do. That's awesome. And buttonholes can be tricky. How was your experience with that? Was it good? Yeah, yeah I was, I was like, like surprised. surprised. I was like, oh my oh gosh, gosh, this machine, machine has the setting and it can basically, basically do it for me. me. So it so worked. Work. That, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, and then we talked, that could be a neat one to integrate into wearables if you wanted to for a temp sensor. Um, and then yeah, I, yeah. Can, I can like help you out with the code for this first little bit. And then eventually that would be a great like a nicely scoped input output uh, that's that's all put together. So you could have like your lights light up based on how warm the coffee still is in the cozy. Um, yep, yep. Cool. Uh, let's see. Anybody in the room want to go? You're, yeah, come on up. I need to bring this down. Um, so I made a, a little, uh, I made a wallet um, out of uh, two pieces of leather um, that 
were cut approximately like this. These were like uh, laser cut templates that I did at first to test it out. And so the pieces of leather went like this and were stitched there. And then this folded over like this and these two folded over to create a pocket. Um, and I have like a paper model of it that I did. That, is that lined up? Yeah, yeah you're good. That you can kind of see how it works because it can't take off the, uh, take the, the wallet apart like that. Yeah, the paper, meta the paper model is a really great way to play with the idea. Um, and did you hand stitch that or what did you use for stitching? Yeah, I hand stitched it. Um, so there's, um, there's this tool called a pricking iron that is used to like punch through the leather in regular holes. Um, and so like you can see, so th those holes were all like pre-punched or well, I, I punched them and then I stitched through them. Um, and, and then I also put a pocket on the back. So like if there's a, there's a slit in the um, brown leather piece that's hidden by the blue leather piece. Uh, and then on the inside, there's a part of a bandana that I used as a pocket liner. Um, and so the stitches in there are like a straighter, more basic stitch because they're really going to be seen. Um, and then this is uh, either a cross stitch or a corset stitch, um, which I thought looked really cool. So I decided to do that. Um, and uh, I was actually, I was really surprised when I went to get the leather. Um, I just figured I'd buy like two different colors of leather. Um, but in order to do that, you had to buy it in either like ridiculously small pieces or like a hide, um, which was like way more than I needed and also like $200, you know. It was, um, uh, so I just bought like the, um, the like, veg tanned leather that was not dyed and I was astounded at how easy it was to dye it. Um, it was like just poured the dye into a thing and like dragged the leather through it and then wiped it off and put it aside to dry. Yeah, it was really great. Um, what? So I had to go to this place called Tandy that was up in Berlin, it was like a 30 minute drive, something like that. Um, uh, but they were pretty helpful there. Um, and I got like the thinnest leather that I possibly could. Um, yeah. yeah, my big thing was I wanted it to be able to fit in my front pocket, which is quite a challenge, uh, but it does. Yeah, that's, that's a great little project for sure. That's awesome. All right, thank you. Oops, and then we'll, this is more the view. There you go. And I've got stuff up here also. The, cool. Um, anybody remote want to go next? Is there anybody who's got a thing that they can? They I can, can go, go. Yeah, let's see it, Kate. Um, hopefully you can see, see me and it's not too delayed. Um, I have, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I made a t-shirt quilt. Oh, so cool. <laughs> the best that maybe I like look over how to put it, but um, it's just the backing. Um, and, and wow. For a long time, we finally finished. So, so. It's yeah, very warm. Very warm. That's, How that's long awesome. did it take, Kate? Kate? What's, that? What's that? How long, How did, long it did it take to make that? that? Um, a week. <laughs> um, 
I, 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 um, the big tip that I would say is I, I'm terrible at cutting anything and especially straight lines. So I cut out a 14 to 14 inch square of acrylic in the laser cutter and use that as a template to put on all my shirts. And that definitely helped make it possible. Like I would have been able to pull it off without that little hack, but, um, but yeah. That's. That's great. That's so cool. What a nice piece. And you can keep that for such a long time. That's awesome. And I have uh, viewers fluttering, fluttering, fluttering on my doors, door, so that's even better. better. Yeah, that's, that's actually great. My, I know my wife would love that if I made a t-shirt quilt. <laughs> the, um, okay. Uh, let's see. Any, do you want to come up and talk a little bit more about your, I really want to hear like the, the back and forth between Ruby and Lila, just to talk about like what's what this something stuff was all about. Is this good? Yeah, and I'll make sure that it's pointed. Okay. Hi. Um, so this week I tried, or I learned how to tuft, and I feel like I can go get the gun if you want, but I'll go grab it. okay, it's underneath the table, the far yeah. Um, so this is a test. Um, it didn't go so well here um, in the little sun, but um, you can kind of see that some parts uh, didn't really take that well, and some parts are like pretty sparse. But other parts where I figured out how it really works are really dense and really like lush. Um, and I'll show you the back. So where it didn't work um, was when you move the gun like too fast, um, and so. Basically what it does is it shoots yarn through um, and as you're moving and you don't let go of the trigger, um, it, it, it's a continuous loop. And then when you let go of the, um, of the gun uh, trigger, um, it, it cuts it. Um, that's basically how it works. Um, and here's the gun. You have to like oil it up with like W, what is it called? WD-40? WD-40? Yeah. And you need to dust off like the yarn because this is all exposed. And um, yeah, so the scissors like come out and just like clips it. And it's it goes really, really fast. Um, and it's a little scary. We have some good slow-mo video I'll put in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so this is where it worked not so great. And when I found a really good consistent uh, speed, this is how it ended up coming out. And at first glance, I thought I was supposed to go like the same amount of pressure, but really fast. And that actually wasn't the case. It, and it, you know, ended up looking like that. But this is, this is how you want it to look pretty much. Um, and then I have a bigger piece that I, was my first sort of demo just because I had a leftover frame and I'll show you pretty much, let's see, sorry. Kind of getting the idea, um, but it's really straightforward. I'm really excited that it's not as scary as I thought it would be. Um, and I'm really glad we got this tool. I think it's really awesome. So um, yeah, thanks to JR. Well, you, you did tufting also, so your experience, you made an awesome frame. Can you talk about the frame that you built? I'm really jealous. Yeah, Ruby says that she's really jealous of your frame. Oh, you know, when I make stuff like that, I feel like it's not a big deal. Like, uh, so I just watched the video of the guy make a frame, and then I made that frame, but smaller. And I didn't take any pictures or anything. Because I don't know, when I get in the mood or in the zone, I, I feel like I forgot to stop and take pictures. And I don't know, I just made it. So you like that's where I was. And then I put the um, that material on. And I was thinking later, maybe I should have gone slower. Maybe I should have um, tried it again in another spot. Uh, I'll come yeah, in again, again, and I was I thinking to, to like move what I had over, over and, and try it try again because it, it, it ripped a, a huge gash, gash in the fabric, fabric when, when I tried it. it. 
Yeah, it's there's definitely some strategies to make it work. And if you could connect with Ruby and like work out a time together, I feel like the two of you together would make a beautiful rug with the yeah. expertise yeah. that you I would use. love that. We should definitely, definitely, and I can I help can her help make, her a, make frame a frame and, and anything, if anyone, if anyone wants, wants to make, make a frame, frame, I can show, show them, them how. how. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the frame has got carpet strips up on the sides, which is amazing, but it means you, you gotta be careful when you grab it because those are like <laughs> little nails ready to, ready to get you. Um, but there it's, oh, and then, and then Ruby used the staple gun, which worked also. So those are totally both ways that you can make it. The carpet strips are like reusable for, for anybody all the time sort of deal. Um, Cool. And then anybody else want to share what they did, remote or in person? I know we've got two people in the room. Uh, Jamie, you want to share what you made? Sure. Yeah. I made a few different things. Uh, come, on, come on up. I was getting reacquainted with the sewing machine. Um, so the first thing I did was fix my favorite pants, which I'm wearing and you can't see now, but there is a huge uh, gash in them and yeah huge rip and um, I, I fixed it um, and that was with iron on uh, seam and it worked pretty well and then from there I just need to practice with the sewing machine so I made the world's ugliest tool belt um, oh, uh, yeah it's actually functional it's comfortable uh, I made some pockets hidden here, which you can't really see, and uh, this interesting little King Bunny bit. And then from there, I was able to sew straight lines and made this box cushion cover uh, because I'm doing a custom van build and I'm cutting my mattress in half and also cutting like foam, two inch foam mats to go on the seating area. And so I need to sew a bunch of custom cushions. And so this is what I did. And that's it, Cool. basically. Oh, and I fixed uh, a hat band with some glue. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's awesome. Oh, sorry. You're good. All right, that's exciting. Uh, and then anybody remote still have things that they wanna that they wanna share? Let's see. I think we made it through most of the. Let's see. No, I think I think we're I think we made it. I think we did the show and tell. We got most of everybody. I know that there were a few people who it was just tough to get in sometimes, and so. We'll be all good. We're doing more like sewing sorts of things this week. So if you weren't exactly happy with where it ended up, you can definitely find your way forward this week. And if you need anything, I'm absolutely don't don't be afraid to reach out. It's it's one of the many services I offer, which is how to get back on the tracks and how to get things going again. Uh, sometimes it, it's just you need you need a little soft redirect. I'm happy to do that. Um, but I yeah, what's up? Class should be two hours. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I mean we can. I mean this basically was two hours, so we can we can totally do that where we do. And I think that as we get to more lesson intensive things, it might need to veer a little longer and show and tell gets a little shorter. So I think the push and shove for that is totally possible, and we can make sure that that sort of as we need to do things on the fly, we can make it happen. And like I did some of the lessons earlier on where I would make videos, it might be possible for me to throughout the week make some videos that go over concepts and cover stuff. Uh, that might be useful, especially if they come up with specific things that you want to know more about. I can try and make sure that that happens uh, just with good examples and some show and tell. So those are, those are all possible things. That's a great suggestion to try and make sure that we've got a little bit more time and allocate out a little bit more. We can totally do that. Um, and so we can figure out what is the best fit at any given time. But that I think is the, the end. We should probably call it for the recorded part of class. And then we can go to a more informal question and answer where we just leave the call up. We can talk about stuff. If you wanted to come up and grab any electronics, you're welcome to. If you want to see where I broke a solder joint and like how I'm going to fix that, I can show you that also. 
Um, but yeah, that's probably it for today. So thank you everybody for the show and tell. That was lovely. And uh, yeah, that, thank that's you. it. Thank you. Yeah, good luck this week. If you need anything, please reach out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.